Welcome to Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now you can learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property. Learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau with the Mineola Law Firm of Shane Doxtanisi and Corker. He's a member of the Committee on Professional Ethics of the Bar Association of Nassau County and counsel to the Nassau Academy of Law. And now, here is your host for Law You Should Know, attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. Today we're continuing our discussion about the new rights of tenants uh, granted by the New York State Legislature in 2019. And there are many things that, many rights for tenants and many different new issues that attorneys should know about. In fact, we're offering CLE credit for this show through the Nassau Academy of Law. Just be sure to record the code at the end of the show, and there may be some administrative fee from the Nassau Academy of Law. Our guest again is Eileen O'Toole. She's a landlord tenant attorney and expert on the new laws, and she's worked very hard to present interesting facts during this program. She's also the author of the Rent Regulation Checklist, just the 2020 edition was just published by the Habitat Group, and that book may have, be of special interest to attorneys and landlords. Eileen, welcome back to Law You Should Know. Thanks, Ken. One of the changes you've mentioned, and I thank you for doing these shows, is the changes about securities and security deposits. So tell us about that. Okay. Um, we talked recently about now for unregulated apartments, the general obligations law limits the collection of a security deposit or uh, prepayment of rent just to one month. So, but the, it did more than that. And um, curiously, this, these things that I'm going to talk about now, they're, they only apply in the law to unregulated apartments. But um, they may be things that some landlords may actually want to do for their rent-stabilized tenants just um, to have some paperwork. What, what the new law says is that tenant before a tenant moves in, a tenant has signed a lease, say, mid-January, and the lease is supposed to start February 1st. The law now says that the tenant has the right to inspect the apartment before moving in and get a signed agreement between the landlord and the tenant listing any conditions that might be there um, that, you know, it's agreed they, these would not be any grounds for retaining the security deposit because there are already conditions that li exist in the apartment. So that's that's one thing at the beginning. Then when a tenancy is coming to an end, um, either the lease is going to end or a tenant has, has said they're going to move out at some point, tenants have a right to have the landlord come inspect the apartment and confirm whether there's any conditions that are going to make the landlord say we're entitled to keep your security deposit or we're entitled to keep part of your security deposit. So, Assuming that the tenant has given enough notice, sometime between 7 to 14 days before the tenant is moving out, the landlord is supposed to come inspect the apartment. And after they do that, they're supposed to give the tenant a list of conditions that will warrant keeping all or part of the security deposit and giving the tenant a right to cure um, if, you know, children have marked up the walls with magic marker or somebody has punched a hole in the wall when they were moving something. These are things that um, generally, you know, the landlord would have the, the right to, uh, to take some of the security deposit for. Um, so, they, you know, the, the, the landlord is supposed to give the tenants um, the list of these conditions and... So the tenant would, in, you know, in theory, have a right to cure some of them. Then after the tenant moves out, usually, you know, in the past, tenants don't get their security deposits back until after they've moved out and the landlord has determined whether any money is supposed to be held back. 
Um, so now the law says that within 14 days after the tenant moves out, the landlord has to send the tenant an itemized statement indicating if they're going to keep any of the security deposit and why. You can keep the security deposit if the tenant owes rent um, that's been unpaid or if the tenant has caused damage to the apartment beyond just wear and tear or if the tenant has left furniture and other stuff in the apartment that has to be hauled out of there and you have, you know, moving costs for that stuff. Um, The landlord is also, if they're not withholding any of the money, supposed to send the tenant the security deposit refund within 14 days. And the law now says that if um, the landlord doesn't do these things, if they haven't sent the tenant that statement within 14 days or sent them the deposit within 14 days, that they'll forfeit any right to retain any portion of the deposit. And if let's say someone punched a, a hole in the wall, do they they just get the can the landlord just charge the cost of plastering it up, or they're entitled to a whole new sheet of uh, sheetrock or whatever that whole wall is made out of? Well, that's um, that might be something you'd have to figure out on a case by case basis. I would say offhand, I would say if someone has punched a hole in the wall, you know, or made a hole that's the size of a fist. I mean, you could probably fix that with plastering over it. Um, but if it was a hole from, let's say you had you hung a painting and it's a nail hole, is that wear and tear on the apartment? If it's a nail hole, that would likely just be ordinary wear and tear and not something that you should be withholding the security deposit. I mean, in between vacancies, you would presumably be fixing up an apartment by painting it and you would, uh, you know, any nail holes or things like that would be, uh, that's really a, a repair item. That's not uh, a damage, a damage item. Okay, and were you were there other issues you were going to mention about the security department or return of security? Well, just that there. In addition to um, if if um, if the landlord doesn't follow the new provisions, um, you know, aside from the fact that if you don't notify the tenant within fourteen days of any money you want to withhold, that you you forfeit the right to do so. If you um, don't comply, you can be found to be responsible for punitive damages up to twice the amount of the deposit. So not complying with these new provisions to notify the tenant within two weeks and refund the money, um, if you're not withholding anything, that can make you subject to having to pay them twice the amount of the deposit. Wow. And Uh, do you... um do you have to notify them of their right to that pre-inspection? The pre-inspection, yes. You're supposed to send them um, a notice that they have the right to the inspection. And then you're supposed to, on 48 hours notice, confirm the, the, the apartment inspection before the tenant moves out. The one, if the tenant doesn't give you sufficient notice of when they're moving out, then you, do, you won't have to do that. But um, if it's too close to the move out date by the time they notify you. So, but in, ge- in general, assuming you have enough notice, you're supposed to set up that in- inspection beforehand. Okay. Um, Go ahead. What are some other changes that you feel are important for tenants and for lawyers about, to know about? Well, about security deposits um, themselves, there is a provision that. The say a new owner buys the building, and in purchasing the building, the the pride the seller represents that it doesn't have any security deposits. So the new owner is supposed to send a notice to tenants within 30 days of closing, saying, you know, hello, we bought the building, and no security deposit was transferred um, to us for your apartment. If this is the case. So then if the tenant turns around, the tenant then has 30 days under the uh, under the law to respond to the new landlord and say, well, yes, I did pay a security deposit and here's my cancel check or here's my lease provision saying that, you know, I'm paying a, uh, a security deposit. So therefore, um, 
you're responsible for, you know, refunding my security deposit when I leave. So if the tenant shows that they did pay a security deposit, the new landlord is going to be responsible for paying back the security deposit, even if the old landlord told the new landlord that they didn't have any security deposit. Um, one thing, the law actually also says this, one thing that the someone buying a building can do if there's a question about whether the owner may have security deposit, the old owner may have a security deposit or that a tenant may claim there was a security deposit paid, the seller can put into escrow um, one month's rent, you know, for each of the tenants prior to the closing so that that money is there in case it turns out that um, tenants did pay security deposits. Okay. In a, in, in a moment, I just want to... I wanted to ask you to focus on the new laws that cover retaliation and things along that line. I just want to remind our audience, you're listening to 90.3 WHTC, the voice of Nassau Community College. I'm talking with Eileen O'Toole. She's a landlord tenant attorney and also the author of the rent regulations checklist. The 2020 edition has just been published by the Habitat Group. Attorneys can earn CLE credit for listening to this program. Just record the code at the end of the show. And if you missed any portion of the program or you want to tell someone else about it or listen to other shows that are part of our series about the new rights of tenants, just look for our podcast at nccradio.org. So, Eileen, what what are some of the changes about um, refusing to refusing by landlords to rent to tenants due to some dispute or past dispute? Okay, well, um, a landlord is not allowed now to use information from prior cases to... um, You know, to refute a landlord cannot use information about prior cases to refuse to rent to a tenant. Um, there, in the past, there were what they would call blacklisting. You know, there would be uh, companies that went and scoured court computer records and then would sell to landlords information about the history of a tenant. You know, if you had a tenant who had had a number of non-payment proceedings commenced, um, that might be something. If you had a tenant that was evicted in a nuisance case, you know, these things were information that was sold by companies and then used as grounds for not renting to tenants. There's also, um, there was a provision added last year to the state judiciary law, I mean, the court system itself would sell data to these companies. And now the court system is barred from selling that data to companies. Now, I think that there are tenant advocates who would maintain even today that even with these changes in the law, owners are still able to obtain um, some of this information and to use this information, even though they're not supposed to. And what about how? What are the what kind of rights do tenants have if they're if they just have a month to month relationship with the landlord? Or well, let's say you have a room, you have a roommate in your apartment or house, and you want to legitimately kick them out. What kind of notice provisions are there? Well, if someone is a month to month tenant and doesn't have a lease. Um, and the landlord wants to terminate the tenancy just, you know, because they're month to month and not, not with any, you know, reason beyond that. Um, you have to serve at least a 30 day notice of termination. Um, you know, before you actually bring a proceeding to, to evict. If you have a roommate and it's a month to month situation, you would also have to serve a 30-day notice, um, you know, to evict before you did so. There, you know, there have also been, 
you know, there were changes in the law uh, six months ago for situations where you had unregulated leases. You may have discussed this in some prior shows. Uh, you had an unregulated lease. There was no requirement in the past to give the tenant any notice about terminating that tenancy when the lease expired. It's just the lease expired, and if you hadn't negotiated a renewal lease with that tenant and they didn't move out, you could just take them to housing court to evict them with a a notice of petition. Now you have to give those tenants a prior notice. You know, you have an unregulated tenant, the lease is coming up for expiration, you're not planning to renew the lease as the landlord. You have to give the tenant some prior notice that you don't intend to uh, renew the lease and that the tenant is supposed to move out. And we're talking about residential uh, situations here, not commercial. Generally, yes. Um, yes, generally this stuff is, is to con- is concerns residential tenancies, yeah. Did a tenant also have a prediction, a protection against retaliation? Let's say they're already a, a tenant and they want to make complaints about their landlord to different city agencies or to, they have bad about them to other tenants or on social media. Is it, do they have a protection of, against retaliation under the new law? They do. I mean, there actually was protection for the tenants even... Um, even under the old law, uh, the law was amended. That's Real Property Law Section 223B. It was amended in June, and it, it, it extends when someone makes a claim that there has been retaliation by the landlord, and that's the grounds for eviction. Um, the, the presumption that there's been retaliation has been extended from six months to a year, and warrant the breach of warranty of hab- habitability. You know the. Uh, you know that the tenant is claiming that um, that an apartment has conditions in it that are making it uninhabitable. If a tenant has complained about that, that is a grounds for claim uh, claiming retaliatory eviction. If the the landlord then is suing to evict the tenant after they have made a warranty of habitability claim, and good faith actions by a tenant you know, complaining to HPD for um, for repairs is considered a grounds for making a retaliatory eviction claim. Um, you know, a landlord's agent can be accused of retaliation that can be attributed to the landlord. And if a new lease um, has an unreasonable rent increase, that's prohibited and that can be a grounds for claiming re- retaliation. So if the super gives you a dirty look or, or curses at you, that's sort of retaliation by their agent? Well, it, it would depend on the facts, whether, um, you know, whether it, it amounts to that. Um, that, that. But if you're talking about retaliation, it's more if the, you know, if the agent has, um, if you've had some dispute with the agent or the agent is responsible for, uh, you know, responding to your, your claims about the apartment or your complaints about the apartment, um, that's, that can be a grounds for raising a retaliation right. claim. You, you mentioned earlier about six to nine month period. What exactly does that mean that you have a grace, you have an extra release, relief of six to nine months? Well, what previously, if you were claiming that a landlord was acting in retaliation against you for something that you did within six months before um, the eviction action was commenced, that that would be a period that the court could look at what was done. Now that's been extended to a year. So if anything happened within the past year, that, that before a landlord started an eviction proceeding and you as the tenant are saying, oh, okay, they're, they're bringing this action against me in retaliation for my complaint, the court can look back a year, not just okay, six months. Okay, so that's the look back period. Yeah. Okay. I just want to remind our listeners, you're listening to 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College. 
and you're, you're listening to Law You Should Know, and you can also hear the program or any portions that you've missed or tell someone else about it on the podcast at nccradio.org. We're talking about the new rights of tenants with attorney Eileen O'Toole, a landlord tenant attorney based in Manhattan, and she is also the author of The Rent Regulation Checklist. The 2020 edition has just been published by the Habitat Group. Eileen, we're entering the final uh, portion of the program. One important issue is attorney fees. How has that been affected? The landlord's ability to try to collect attorney fees or perhaps the tenant's ability to try to collect them. How has that been changed by the new laws? Okay, that's something that um, I'm still waiting to see some court decisions on this. This is one of the things that is coming up in housing court. You have, um, there was a change in, in the laws that specifically says if a landlord gets a default judgment against the tenant, like in these non-payment cases, tenant never shows up, never responds to the non-payment petition, the landlord gets a judgment of possession from the court based on the tenant's default. The law now says that you cannot, as the landlord, get attorney's fees, even though you, you won the case, you won because of the tenant's default. So the court, the law says that the landlord cannot get attorney fees in that situation. But there's some conflicting provisions also in um, in the laws. You have had in the past and still have a provision that says, you know, in a lease, most boilerplate leases have a provision saying that um, if a landlord has to bring an eviction proceeding and wins the case against the tenant, the landlord is entitled to attorney's fees. And they're in the um, real property law there has been a provision for real property or, or RPFL. There's been a provision for a long time saying that if, in, on the other hand, the tenant won the case, even if the lease doesn't say that, the tenant is entitled to attorney's fees. So you have that provision. And so in housing court cases, if one side or the other won, then you'd have a hearing if one side or the other was claiming the attorney's fees against the other to find out how much would be awarded. But now there is there is a separate provision. We talked about um, in a prior program that uh, rent, the term rent is defined for residential non-payment cases as just to be the straight rent. It can't include, include any other additional charges or things that the lease calls additional rent. Many leases refer to attorney's fees that can be sought in cases as additional rent. So the argument has been made that, well, if attorney's fees are additional rent, you can't claim them in the housing court proceeding. You would have to bring a separate action in civil court, if assuming you win the case, to collect the attorney's fees. So there's this um, conflict between these different provisions of the law. The it, the argument's been coming a lot, up a lot um, since the law was changed in housing court cases, and I have not yet seen a court decision that um, rules definitively on this one way or the other. And this could be the change with many of these procedures that they have yet to be interpreted and applied by the courts and their and those decisions reviewed by the appellate courts. Yes, and that reminds me one thing I um, will mention at this point, um, you know, we're just six or seven months after the laws were changed, you know, and, and backpedaling a little to more the rent stabilization law changes. You know, you had various things um particularly with the rent overcharge provisions, you know, where it's now you look back six years instead of four years, you know, to determine rent overcharge. Um, a lot of landlords in pending cases have, even though the law was applied to cases pending at the time it changed on June 14th of 2019, a lot of landlords have argued in court cases and before DHCR that, um, the law shouldn't be changed on them in the middle of their case. It should only apply to future cases. And these cases have already gotten into the appellate court. And in fact, there's a, a, several of these cases that were um, 
sent up to the Court of Appeals already, and they were argued a few weeks ago, and we're waiting for what the Court of Appeals will have to say about the retroactive application of, um, you know, changes in overcharge liability. And we'll, I'm landlords. sure we'll cover it in a future show. We only have two minutes left. I just want to remind our listeners, what you've heard is information only. If you are if you can afford to and you're renting a, a house or a room or an apartment, it's always good to go to an attorney and make sure your rights are protected and the lease is follows these laws and regulations. And especially if you're a landlord, as you've heard, you cannot exercise self-help. You have to go to an attorney, perhaps someone like Alina O'Toole, or in drafting a, a lease that applies to law and protects your rights at a maximum, it's worth your while to go to an attorney. And I, I just want to give you a minute if you want to summarize any th- important things for attorneys or tenants to remember. Um. Just it, it's important to stay informed. One source more for the rent stabilization law changes is to look at the DHCR's website, Division, State Division of Housing and Community Renewal. Take a look at that because they do continue to um, modify some of their fact sheets and forms since the law was changed. The DHCR now has to issue a report every year on how they're operating and, you know, various statistical information. They've already put out the report for 2019. And um, there are various tenant organizations and landlord organizations that put out newsletters that provide information on a periodic basis, um, you know, maybe a monthly basis. And it, uh, yes, if you have an issue that... um, you're not sure what to do about because of changes in the law. It can be helpful to contact an attorney. I, for one, can be found at O'ToolelawNYC.com. And um, we do expect changes to the rent stabilization regulations by the end of June. That, you know, the law was changed in June of 2019. And one of the things the law said was the HCR was supposed to issue new uh, regulation changes by the end of June of 2020. Okay, I wish we had from some more time, but just remember you've been listening to Eileen O'Toole, the author of the Rent Regulations Checklist, published by the Habitat Group, the code number for CLE purposes through the Nassau Academy of Law. You've got to contact them for details. Is 2866. The code is 2866. Please join us next week at this same time on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College, or this show and many others are available as a podcast at nccradio.org.